How's it going everybody and welcome back to another pool coaching video. For those that might be new to my channel, what I like to do in these types of videos is that pool players send me videos of themselves playing through two or three racks of eight ball. I'll watch through each rack and try to provide some type of commentary as to what I think they might be trying to do. But then at the end of each rack, I'll go back to what I think are key areas where I can offer some type of advice. That could be what I believe to be a flaw in their form, maybe a flaw in their stroke, maybe even offer a different type of pattern that they could have ran than the one that they've chosen. Anything that I can possibly think of that I believe that they could use to help improve their game. And then I also highly suggest that you as the viewers leave a comment on these videos that you can also try to help the player improve their game as well. And for today's video, I'd like you to meet Roberto. He's going to be playing through three racks of eight ball. So let's see what we can do to help him out. All right, Roberto, show us what you got with this first rack. Okay, very nice controlled break there. I like how you stayed down on the break. You did make a solid, so let's see if you're going to be playing by APA or BCA rules. And actually, I did forget to mention that Roberto comes all the way from Ibiza, Spain. So I've got someone from across the ocean, which is awesome. Okay, so you did make a solid, so it looks like you're going to stay with solids. We start with the six ball. You actually kind of fired that in. Looks like you have position on the four ball, maybe even the three ball, and I think that's the seven ball that's actually on your left rail. But since you're choosing solids, I'm kind of wondering what are you gonna do with I think that's the I think that's the two ball tied up with the eleven. Well, now the two ball's tied up with the seven ball. Okay, so now on over to stripes. Okay, nice shot there with the 13 ball to go into the side pocket. I'm always a big fan of seeing the, uh, the balls actually kind of gracefully roll their way over to the pockets rather than just flying in. You like that shot right there it looks like you hit it a little bit harder than you did your last shot but you were still able to make the shot so you can tell by how the ball actually rotates across the table to see the speed of the actual hit okay good shot there doing a pretty good run here with stripes i kind of feel like maybe you overran that shot though because you have the, I think this is the 15 ball and the 14 ball that you just went right through, and you didn't really get position on them. So you have position on the 14 ball, and it looks like that's what you're going to shoot at. Oh, nice try. Just barely undercut the ball. Okay, back over to solids. Pretty set up here for the one ball here into the corner pocket. Whoa. That one looked like you hit pretty hard. What made you feel the need to hit the ball that hard? What ball were you going to be setting up for? Nonetheless, back over to stripes. Oh, and you're ambidextrous. So that's pretty cool. Actually hit that one pretty well. Oh, another good shot. Looks like now you're going to be forced to cut the 11 ball into the corner pocket. Really good shot there. And it looks like your setup. I can't tell what color that is. Is that the so you have a is that a pink 4 ball so therefore you have a pink 12 ball?
and then you change your mind. You don't want to shoot that one with your offhand. There we go. A little bit of a stretch here. Oh, but you caught the ball too thick. Okay, so for those that are wondering why we can't uh, hear anything, um, he is playing in a public pool hall, and that's why you kind of see some jumps here and there. So like what you're going to see here is a jump because uh, some uh, other people got in the way of the camera. Um, so the shot that he tried to take there was the 7 ball, and he did, in fact, miss it to where now he shot at the 12 ball here. So now back on over to Solid. Looks like you're going to try the 7 ball again. Good shot there, but it looks like you might have overran the cue ball again. You had the two ball and the three ball right there next to the seven, so I'm not sure why to see that the cue ball is all the way down here. Looks like we undercut the one ball, so back on over to stripes. Let's see if you can cut the 12 ball down to the bottom left corner pocket. And just a bit of an undercut there. A okay, good shot on the one ball. Okay, good shot. Looks like you have a, posi a decent position on the three ball there. Nice shot there setting up for the two. It looks like you might be done here. Left-handed shot for the two ball. Eight ball side pocket. And nicely done there. Okay, so if I had to count that, I think that took you four full turns, meaning you trade from solids to stripes to solid to stripes, because you made a solid on the break. So player one was solids while player two was stripes. So every time you missed a stripes, I count that as an inning. And I think it took you four innings uh, to get through this rack. Um, one quick summary that I can say, if I were to just look at this rack overall, you seem to have better accuracy at making balls when you hit the cue ball softer. That's at least what I was able to see. Uh, so I think that's probably going to be one of the overarching things that I might end up saying about your game, depending upon what these next two racks would look like. But before we get to those next two racks, I do have a couple of spots in this rack that I would like to talk about a little bit more. So let's go take a look at that. So here's the first spot I'm going to comment on, and this is going to be with a small flaw that I see in your form. Because I didn't see you do this on every shot that you had during this rack, but this one stood out the most. Here you're about to shoot the 10 ball, and the tip of your cue is already really close to the cue ball, so you're about ready to fire. So I would expect that your grip hand would have been somewhere right around here, right underneath your elbow, so that way you can kind of create a 90 degree angle between your shoulder, your elbow, and your grip hand. But your grip hand is all the way back here on the back end of the cue, which is pretty much going to tell me that you're not going to have that much of a follow through when you actually hit this shot. So I'm actually going to verify this by playing this frame by frame. So when you pull back, you can see that you're pretty much going to stop right when your grip hand actually is underneath your elbow. So you practically do not have a follow through on this shot. Now, it's not really that big of a deal because you made the shot, right? That's all great and wonderful. But when it comes to actually trying to control the cue ball, one of the more common things that you're going to hear is about how you need to make sure that you follow through the cue ball. A good six inches or so, sometimes even longer, depending upon how much power that you're actually going to put into the uh, shot. So on every shot, I would at least suggest, if you're able to, because there are always some type of exceptions, but when your tip is that close to the cue ball, that your grip hand should be located right underneath your elbow like this, pretty much creating a 90 degree angle between your shoulder, your elbow, and your grip hand. So that way you can perform a backswing and a forward swing, or I should, uh, should say stroke, and actually have a decent follow through. Instead here, your hand is already back here, and so when you actually hit the cue ball, you stop pretty much right here when you still have more room that you can actually follow through. So keep that in mind. You'll actually notice how much of a difference it actually does make with your stroke when you do actually follow through the cue ball, and you'll actually see a different type of reaction you're going to get out of the cue ball, especially if you incorporate some amount of spin on the cue ball. Here's the next spot I'd like to comment on, and there's a couple of things I'm going to mention here. You're about to shoot the one ball into the corner pocket, and you hit this rather hard, in my opinion, and you ended up overcutting the ball and causing the one ball to catch the short rail right around here. 
And it was during the playthrough of this rack that you had heard me ask, what made you feel the need to hit the ball as hard as you did, especially when you have the four ball sitting very close by? Because it would appear to me that all you really needed to do was to just roll the cue ball on up to the one ball, just like how you did with other shots during this rack, have the one ball roll its way to the corner pocket, and your cue ball is naturally going to roll its way over to the side rail and then come back out, possibly bump into the 15 ball or stop just before it, and you're automatically going to be set up for position on the four to go into the top left corner pocket. Now, with regards to how hard you did hit this shot, the next thing I want to show you here is, and probably the reason why you missed the shot, is your stroke. If we were to look at the position of your cue, it would appear that you're going to hit the center of the cue ball, or maybe even slightly to the right of center of the cue ball. But when I play this frame by frame, watch where you actually hit the cue ball. And do you see that right there? You end up putting a little bit of left spin on the cue ball. And that type of movement there before you strike the cue ball is going to cause your cue ball to deflect to the right, which is probably what caused you to overcut the shot. And then when the cue ball hits the side rail here, because you have left spin, that's what causes it to come back and almost want to run into the 15 ball, but the one ball knocks it out of the way. So maybe you wanted to hit the ball as hard as you did because you thought your cue ball was going to run into the 15 ball and you wanted to use it as a break in order to get position on the four ball. But since you have this side to side motion or twitching motion, or basically you are moving before you strike the cue ball and putting unintentional side spin, or at least what I believe to be unintentional side spin. Because if you did want to put left spin on the cue ball, then during your pre-shot routine, we should pretty much see that the tip of your cue starts at putting left spin on the cue ball. So when we watch you do other shots during this rack, we can see how slow you're actually moving and see that you're in a little bit more control of your stroke when you're doing that, which is why I can easily suggest that you should slow down on a lot of your shots. And it doesn't matter that you're playing on a nine foot table, especially if you're still in the learning phase of the game. Take your time, hit the shots slowly and softly, and make sure that you're actually striking the cue ball where you wanna strike it. And therefore, you know that if you miss the shot, then hopefully the only thing that is wrong with the shot is how you're actually aiming. And this is going to be the final spot in the rack that I'm going to comment on. And we're gonna talk about pattern play here. Because at this shot here, as solids, you try to start by playing the seven ball into the corner pocket here. And you must have missed because we really didn't get to see this shot as people started to come around the camera and I edited them out. And then later we saw that you tried to bank the 12 ball afterwards. Now, it's not like there's anything wrong with starting with the seven ball. But when I look at this one ball, I think it's in a bit of a tricky spot. The 12 ball currently blocks it from going here into this corner pocket. So right now we can only go into the side pocket here or this corner pocket. But if we look at the position of your cue ball, you're currently in a position right now where you can play the one ball into the side pocket, which is what I'm going to suggest. That way you don't have to worry about trying to get position on the one ball later. So a possible run out pattern that I see here is to play the one into the side pocket and stun the cue ball over for position on the three, making sure that you avoid getting hooked behind the eight. Play the three ball into the side pocket and with some top spin, have the cue ball roll forward and try to get fairly straight in on the two ball. Because then you play the two ball into the top right corner pocket and have the cue ball roll forward as well for position on the seven. But you don't want to be straight in on the seven. You do want to have some sort of a cut angle. So probably somewhere right around here. Because that way when you cut the seven ball to your left, the cue ball will automatically go into the short rail. And here is where you would want some intentional left spin on the cue ball. So that way the cue ball will spin its way down to over here and get position on the four ball where you play this into the bottom left corner pocket, stop the cue ball, and then play the eight ball into the upper right corner pocket. Now, as I mentioned, there's nothing wrong with starting with the seven ball. I'm pretty sure there is a run out pattern that you could have come up with and still be able to finish the table. But you leave room for error if you don't get position on the one ball. So that's why I suggest starting with the one ball. But like I also said, my pattern is not the only pattern. And this is where I usually like to encourage the viewers that when you get to this spot here, leave a comment in the comment section and let us know what type of pattern you would suggest that Roberto should do. 
So now this is all I have for you on rack one. So let's move over to rack two and see what we can find out. All right, Roberto, here we are with rack two. So let's see how you can do with this one. Okay, so not as clean of a break as you had in rack one. You even lost control of the cue ball as it goes around the rack. You also ended up with a dry break, which is really not that big of a deal. We don't expect you to make a ball on the break every single solitary time, but we do want to try to make sure that your form of your break is consistent from one rack to the other. And it doesn't appear that you had a clean hit like you did in the previous rack. So it doesn't look like you have much to start with except for the seven ball here. Probably could have also shot the three ball into the side pocket. But playing that seven ball the way that you did, what ball were you planning on playing next? Because you hit that a little on the hard side for it to travel as far as it did. And I can't really tell if you're really hooked behind the five ball. And we can see since you're looking around the table right now, this would be a sign of you played your shot. You waited for the cue ball to stop. And then you try to figure out what to do next. And what I would like to see in future games for yourself is that you should know or at least have an idea of what ball you're going to play next after the current shot because you have an idea of where the cue ball is going to go. So what are we looking at here? Are you aiming at the two ball? You were, and that was a great shot. Good recovery. Cue ball is pretty much in the middle of a table. Looks like you have a shot on the one ball, the three ball, maybe even the six ball. The four ball is kind of concerning, right? With the nine ball blocking it, it looks like you can only make it into the upper right corner pocket if you can actually get over towards the left side rail. So let's see what you do here. Taking a glance at the six ball, it looks like. Okay, there it looks like you've addressed the four ball, but seeing your hand do this, it doesn't look like you're not quite sure what you're going to do with it. Okay, so we at least play the three ball into the side pocket. Measuring up for the six to go in the side. Okay, good shot there. So here, were you, were you trying to play position for the four ball? Does the four ball go past the nine into the side pocket? Because if it is, that was a great shot to get that type of position for it. Oh, what was that? That looked like a little Dr. Dave 30-degree uh, peace sign. Um, are, you, are you trying to... Carom the four ball off of the eight into the side. Okay, I, th I think that's what you're trying to do. And hey, not a bad effort. Not a bad effort. You missed it by a diamond and a half, but you at least had the idea of that's where the four ball was going to go. So that's really good. The only way you could have gotten possibly closer was to not have the four ball contact the eight so thick. The thinner hit that you would have gotten between the four and the eight, then the closer that you would have gotten to the side pocket. I'm not entirely sure if it would have actually gone. You're at the table. You would know best. But seeing how it actually reacted, that's how it tells me that you ended up uh, hitting the ball too thick into the eight ball. So there it looks like you tried to play the 12 into the side pocket and you ended up overcutting it. So now back over to solids, which doesn't really look like it has much. And now your one ball is tied up with the eight. Looks like maybe you can try to play the four ball into the lower right corner pocket. Okay, and that's what you tried there. Not a bad effort. Just undercut the ball. Now, this shot looks rather familiar. In your last rack, this was the one ball, and you ended up hitting it too hard, and you overcut it. 
Okay, nice little reset there. I like that. And see, you play that one much better. Looks like you put a little bit of a right spin on the cue ball, and you stayed putting right spin on the cue ball uh, this time, where on the last track I showed you where you accidentally put a little bit of left spin on the cue ball, which is probably what caused you to miss the shot. And I really, really like that shot there. You've knocked the eight ball out into the open now. So if you were to complete your run of stripes here, the eight ball at least has a pocket that it can go into. A okay, good shot on the 12. Looks like you have position on the 10 ball. Probably wanted to roll a little bit farther. Looks like you tapped on the table where you actually wanted it. So not really a big deal. It's still cuttable but it looks like you're gonna play something else. Looks like you're looking at the nine ball. Okay, good shot there. What do we do next? It looks like you're gonna play for the 13. And it looks like we missed that one. We bobbled it into the uh, the corner pocket. It looks like you might have maybe slightly overcut it. But now really not so much that you can do with solids here. Okay, it looks like you might be guesstimating on trying to bank the one ball into the bottom left corner pocket. Now, I'm not so sure you had to hit one uh, that hard as well. I mean, you were fortunate that the cue ball ran into the five ball to break the cue ball and give you position for the 10. But you could have also gotten position over there without hitting it as hard as you did. Okay, good shot there. 13 ball, same pocket. Oh, but you overcut the ball. What do we have left here? I can't tell if you can see the five ball, uh, but it looks like you're going to size up for the four ball. This is probably not a bad shot here. The cue ball automatically goes to the side rail and comes back out towards the middle of the table, so you might get position for the one or the five. Oh, but we overcut that one as well. Here, it looks like you're going to play the 13 maybe into the top left corner pocket. That one, you looked a bit rushed. And again, what makes you feel the need to hit the ball is, um, as hard as you're doing? You're actually getting fortunate to get the positions that I think that you're wanting because the cue ball ran into the four ball, which gives you position for the eight. But you also ran into the four ball because you missed the 13 ball. Right? So had you made the 13 ball, you probably would have gotten a completely different result or maybe come relatively close to what you got. So you got to make sure that no matter what amount of power that you're going to put into the cue ball for a certain shot, you got at least to have some idea of where the cue ball is going to go. And more times than not, it doesn't require that hard of a hit that we're at least seeing here. See, like me, personally, I like the way you hit that shot there. Nice and smooth. The cue ball just gently rolls its way up to the four ball and then it just gently knocks it in uh, to the side pocket. So now we have the five ball for the upper left corner pocket. And you just kind of roll that one in. That would be one where you could probably have played a stop shot. So that way you can play the eight ball into the same corner pocket. But now you're set up here for the side pocket. So it's not really that big of a deal.
And again there, awesome. You just gently roll that ball into the side pocket. So I hope you saw what I said on the first comment about how you're mainly playing shots, I think, just a little too hard because you think you have to move the cue ball. Um, or when you play shots too hard, your stroke doesn't stay straight and you end up accidentally throwing in side spin like you did on the one ball in the previous rack. Here on a lot of the shots, you stayed in more control and hit the balls a little bit softer, more control when you did that, and then you ended up making the shot. Plus you had position on another ball that you continued to play the same way. Whereas in some of the other shots that you had on here where you did play them harder, you ended up missing the shot. A slight overcut, and again, that could be because of accidental spin on the cue ball that you weren't aware of. Maybe you just misaimed. Who knows? But so far, between these two racks that we've seen, when you hit the balls softer, you're in more control and you have more accuracy. So that's at least a summary of what I want to say for this rack, and I think I at least have two other spots in this rack that we can take a closer look at. Here's the first spot I'd like to comment on on this rack, and we're going to talk about pattern play again. This is during your run of solids as player two. You had won the previous rack as player one, so player one broke for this rack, and you ended up breaking dry. And then as player two, you started by shooting the seven ball into the corner pocket, and then you almost hooked yourself behind your own five ball, but then you made a really good recovery shot playing the two ball in the same pocket as the seven to land where you are now. And then now from here, you elected to play the three ball into the side pocket, you held the cue ball here for the six ball and then played the six ball into the opposite side pocket and had your cue ball go to the side rail and then come out over here between the 13 and the eight, land behind the four to where you tried to play the four ball off of the eight to go to the same side pocket, but you ended up hitting the eight too thick and ended up going long about a diamond and a half and landed somewhere over here by the five ball. Now, during all of that, you had heard me say about how I think the four ball is going to be a little tricky because of the nine ball and even the 11 ball being here, blocking the path needed in order to play the four ball into this corner pocket here. And I did mention how it's possible to play the four ball in this pocket, but looking back at this, now I'm not so sure because I'm not entirely sure if it passes by the 13 ball. But nonetheless, the pattern that I'm going to suggest either allows you to play the four ball past the 13 ball if it does go, or it gives you two other alternatives if it doesn't go. That is to play the six ball first instead of the three. You can play the six into the side pocket and it looks like you're fairly straight in. So I would put some bottom spin on this cue ball to draw the cue ball back almost back to where you are, but not quite. You do want to fall short just of where you are. So you can have this kind of a cut angle on the three ball to still play the three into the side pocket. That way with some top spin, you can push the cue ball forward to the side rail and then back out here if the four ball is able to go past the 13 ball. Well, let's say that it can't. Well, then you just simply hit a little bit harder so that way the cue ball bumps into the four ball, pushing it closer to the short rail. Therefore, it really passes by the 13 ball to go into the corner pocket. But then let's say you don't get the correct angle or you're just not comfortable playing a shot like that. Then what you would do instead is play the three ball and have the cue ball come off of the side rail and then try to have it come back and clip the nine ball out of the way so that way your cue ball goes this way and gets set up for the four ball to go into this corner pocket. But if we say that your cue ball rolls a little too far, you end up being hooked behind the eight ball, for example, then you have your one ball and your five ball as backup shots. The main reason I at least want to offer some type of suggestion on what you could have done here is to identify the four ball as a trouble ball and try to deal with it as soon as possible, which you did do. I just think that the route that you took was a little bit more difficult than other options that you had here to have access to the four ball and therefore maybe try to be able to run the table at this point in time as solids. And this is going to be the final spot in the rack that I'm going to comment on and I'm going to talk about pattern play again. Because as player one with your run of stripes, I actually think you could have finished the table from here. And that's including with your original route with one minor change or an alternative route. And I'm gonna start with the alternative route first. And that is to play the 12 ball into the side pocket, just like how you did here. But you do have to make sure that your cue ball does roll far enough to where you have position on the 10, though I think the position that you got was actually good enough. Because if I go forward here, here's where your cue ball's at. And to me, that looks doable to be able to cut the 10 ball into the corner pocket. So whether you're here or here, that would be the next shot. Because let's play it from here. 
you play the 10 ball into the corner pocket because it does look like it passes by the one ball and the cue ball comes off of the side rail, possibly two rails, but nonetheless, you want to land somewhere right around here for position on the 11 or the nine. It really doesn't matter because your options are plentiful from here. If you got position on the 11 ball, for example, you can play the 11 ball into the corner pocket, have the cue ball come off of the side rail and then back out towards the same position for the nine ball to go into the same pocket, draw the cue ball back slightly for position on the 13, and then play the 13 into the corner pocket, have the cue ball come off of the short rail, back out for position on the eight, and the rack is done. Or let's say you play the 10 ball and you get position on the nine, like this. Well, then you either decide, do you want to play the nine ball and then draw back for position on the 11, then do the 13 and the eight, pretty much the same order? Or do you draw back just enough to get position on the 13 ball, play the 13 ball instead of getting position on the eight, you get position on the 11. Because then you play a stop shot and then play the eight in the same exact corner pocket. This allows your options to be, or at least allows for more options just in case something kinda goes wrong. But then now let's take a look at your original route. Because from here, instead of playing the 10 ball, you play the nine ball. And at this point here is when you decide to play the 13 ball. But I actually would suggest the 11 ball for the same reason to use the 13 ball to set up for the eight. Because from here, it does look like you have to back cut the 11 ball into the corner pocket. So therefore you can have your cue ball roll out towards the middle of the table for position on the 10. Play the 10 into the same corner pocket as I suggested before and the cue ball naturally comes off of the side rail. And you just have to make sure you hit it hard enough to get position on the 13 to do the same exact pattern as the previous suggestion to play the eight into the same corner pocket. So here it's just ideal to make sure that you're just not trying to do too much work in order to get your out. Because from here, when you played your 13 ball into the corner pocket, or you tried to play it because that's when you missed. Had you made it, it looked like you had position to play the 11 ball into the side pocket, but then you'd have to have the cue ball run down table, hit the short rail, and then come back up for position on the 10. And that just means there's a whole lot more movement on the cue ball. And what I typically like to suggest is small cue ball movements if you're able to. Clearly, if you're going to go from one end of the table to the other, the cue ball movement has to be long. But in situations like what you had here, your cue ball movements could have been smaller. Therefore, you could have been successful at running the table at this point in time. So this is what I got for you on rack two. So now let's go take a look at your final rack. Okay. Here we are with your final rack. You're on a pretty good pace right now, finishing the last two racks in only eight innings. So let's see what you can do with this one. A little bit of a better control on the cue ball as you prevented it from going around the rack. Still ended up with a dry break though. So it looks like the first rack had the best break of them all. You did break this rack as player two because player two won the previous rack. So this costs you an inning. So you're now at nine. And let's see what player one's opening shot is going to be. And I can say here that I really like that you're studying the entire table before you make a decision. That's actually really good. Most beginning players that I've seen, they'll just come up to the table and fire at what they believe to be like an obvious shot. Uh, so for example, I can't tell if the cue ball passes by the four to see the 12 to go into the bottom right corner pocket, but that would be like an obvious shot to start with. Might not be the right shot, but it would be an obvious shot to start with. can't tell what you're looking at at that position. Maybe you're glancing at the four ball. Okay, and it looks like we settled on stripes. 15 in the corner. Oh, but we ended up scratching. So that's where the 
same comment as before as to why did you hit it so hard? It looks like you have the 10 ball that was right next to the 15 ball. So you really all you had to do was just roll it in and you would have had position on the 10 ball. So now with ball in hand, what are we going to do as player two as solids? You can see it looks like you have the one, two, and the six tied up next to, I think that's the nine ball and also the eight ball. So clearly you're going to want to be able to deal with that if you're able to. And it looks like you're trying to figure out how to deal with it. So that's awesome. So since you have ball in hand and you've identified a trouble spot, if you're able to deal with it, go ahead and try to deal with it. And that looks like what you're trying to do. So it looks like you're going to try to play the one ball into the corner pocket and maybe break open the clutter. Oh, but you overcut the ball. Now, when it comes to breaking out clutters, though, like this would be another example of not needing to hit the ball as hard as you did, right? You, you want to get a breakout, right? But you also have to make sure that you have some idea of where the balls that you're planning to break out are going to go. So did you know, for example, that the eight ball was going to end up all the way at the other end of the table to where you possibly could use your four ball to set it up as a final shot? If you didn't, you hit the clutter a little bit softer so that way they just gradually spread open to where all the balls are still accessible and therefore you plan your run out from there. Good shot on the 12 ball. So you see there, you didn't hit that one as hard um, as you've done the previous shots and you were able to make it. Now getting position for another shot, that's a different topic but it really doesn't matter if you get position on the next ball if you miss the shot. The primary focus is to make the shot and then try to get position later. So that's where I would suggest hitting softer as you've played through these racks just to try to increase the accuracy of being able to make the shot. Therefore, you're also learning where the cue ball is going to go and you can actually plan a route to play position for the next shots. Okay, good try on the nine ball. Back over to solids. Looks like you might be set up for the six ball to go into the side pocket. I can't tell if you have access to the one ball or if your own five ball blocks it. And there you just glanced at the six ball, so you're probably going to play that. Okay, you're having to bridge over a ball. Form looks good here. Oh, but it looks like we hit it too soft, and it looks like you didn't hit a rail. So you actually have ball in hand here. Are you aware that you have ball in hand? Maybe not. Okay, so regardless if you're playing eight ball or nine ball, there is a general rule of if you make contact with an object ball and you fail to make it, something has to hit a rail. It could be the cue ball, it could be the ball that you hit, it could be another ball. Just something has to hit a rail because if you don't, then that is a ball in hand foul. Okay, good shot there. The only issue that I have with what you're doing here is what are you gonna do with the 11 ball, right? If you had an opponent in this situation here, like it looks like you can possibly play the 13 ball into the side pocket, maybe get position for the nine. And then what do you do with the 11, right? You're forced to just play the 11 and then separate it from the seven and the six. And whoever solids is now has complete advantage over the table, even though they have more balls on the table than you. Because all they have to do is just make a ball and then play some sort of safety, either on purpose or even accidental if you're playing a lower skill level player and you're hoping that they're going to make a mistake and give you a shot at your final ball, meaning you've now lost control of the table. So unless you had a plan to do something with that 11 ball, I probably wouldn't have suggested that you make that last ball that you did, or if you make this nine ball here, because then you wanna be able to use these balls to possibly make them later and then break out your 11 ball at the same time. So really, I would just go ahead and break the 11 ball out now so that way you have two stripes on the table that hopefully your opponent makes a mistake and leaves position on one of them. So 
It looks like you're going to try to play the nine. Good shot there, but still, like I said, so now you're going to hit the 11. Where's, if you're lucky that the 11 goes, then okay, then hopefully you have a shot at the uh, eight ball. But if the 11 ball doesn't drop anywhere, now you're waiting for solids to make some sort of mistake to where you hopefully have position on the 11. So there at least looks like maybe you tried to carom the 11 off the six to go into the side pocket. So that was probably going to be a good shot, but then you wouldn't have had position on the eight. All right. So really in a position like this, if you're up against a smart player, you will more than likely lose the game because they will just piece the rack apart one ball at a time, making sure that you don't have a shot on your 11 ball. And then when they're ready to attack the table, then they'll run the rest of the table. So that's something you might want to think about when it comes to strategy. Just because you're able to make a ball doesn't mean you necessarily have to if you have no idea what you're going to do with the remaining balls on the table, especially if one is tied up like your 11 ball was. Ooh, a bit of an undercut there on the one ball. So this is what you would be hoping would happen as stripes to have a shot like this. I mean, can it go past the seven or do you have half a pocket? Yeah, maybe you only had half a pocket and you, and you just barely had enough room and just uh, barely nicked that seven. One ball in the side pocket. Oh, we didn't. That one we didn't cut enough. Is there? It looks like you had position on what either the the three ball or the or the seven, I guess, because I, I can't tell if you can back cut the two. Uh, certainly doesn't look like you can play that. Nice shot. Oh, but we scratched. Oh man, that's always a heartbreaker. Now here with solids, pattern selection is very important, right? You want to definitely try to figure out how to run the table or play the same type of strategy that I talked about before. Make a ball or two and then play some sort of a defensive shot uh, where the opponent doesn't have a shot at the eight ball. And that doesn't necessarily mean hiding the cue ball behind another ball, right? You can clearly see that the eight ball is blocked by the four ball. So if you were, for example, to hit the one ball into the rail to where the eight, or the cue ball is now straight in with the eight ball, there's probably not much your opponent would be able to do to be able to play the eight. But if you feel like you're able to run the table, then go right ahead like you're doing so. Oh, <laughs> is that the second or third time uh, the one ball going into that corner pocket? That corner pocket must hate the one ball. But this is what I was talking about, right? So now what does the opponent do? Like the only thing the opponent has is possibly a kick shot. But do you risk something like that in an actual match? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Because it does look like you're going to try to kick the eight ball into the bottom right corner pocket. It looks like you're trying to use the double the distance uh, measuring system. So you find where the ghost ball uh, point is, put the uh, hand on the rail, put the cue back to the rail, and wherever your hand is on the cue, you aim that straight towards the cue ball, and that gives you a spot on the rail to figure out where to kick the cue ball. So we're trying to kick the cue or kick the eight ball into the bottom right corner pocket. We at least make a good hit. Oh, but we don't want that to happen. Oh no, <laughs> because then that would be considered a loss. Man, that sucks. It would have been great had you called that pocket. But in this situation here, we can see that this rack here gave you the most problems. Now, there's really not a whole lot I think I want to go ahead and go and comment on except for one particular thing because I think I actually gave you more than enough information during the playthrough of this rack. A lot dealing with things that I said in rack two and in rack one. But for now, there is one thing that I do want to go back and emphasize on, so let's go look at it. And this is going to be the only spot in the rack that I'm going to comment on, and it's probably something I should have commented on in your previous rack and that's going to be your break. The most common spot I typically talk about whenever a player sends me a video to review. Now, your first break I thought was fine. 
you stayed down, you followed through the cue ball, you got a good clean hit, a good spread, good control of the cue ball, and you even made a ball. But on your second break, not so much, right? You lost control of the cue ball, it went around the rack, you didn't really get a good spread, and you ended up breaking dry. But like I said before, breaking dry really isn't that all big of an issue because we don't expect you to make a ball every single solitary time, especially since you're not even using some form of a template rack. You are using a regular rack, so therefore you're not getting the perfect rack that you'd want to have that a template rack could actually give you. But on this break here, there's actually another flaw in your stroke, and this is probably the reason why you have a flaw in your stroke on your regular shots. Because with this break here, you actually hit it kind of with a snap and not like a good flow through, meaning that you pull the cue back and then freely and smoothly follow through the cue ball. Instead, you kind of snap the cue back and then snap the cue forward. And watch what happens here when you do that as I play this in slow motion. Because if we were to look right now, it looks like you're going to try to hit slightly below center on the cue ball. But as I play this slowly, watch where you actually hit. You start to come up right here and then bam, you hit just slightly above center and then your cue goes up a little bit higher. So I'm not exactly sure if you actually hit directly in the center, even though it looks like you wanted to hit below center or you did hit above center. It's really hard to tell as we look at this frame by frame and then you try to drive your cue back down into the table. So you actually start here, then you come up and then you come back down when you actually strike the cue ball. So in other words, if I were to have you take the bottle test, and that is to try to stroke your cue through the opening of a bottle without touching the rim, you'd end up failing the bottle test. And so that's why I want to make sure that even when you're breaking, you got to make sure that you're going to strike the cue ball where you want to strike it, just like when you're doing a shot. Now, if you want to have power in your break, there's nothing wrong with that, but also try to make sure that you have control. And the easiest way that I know to gain control is to slow down hit the brake softer first. Make sure that you're hitting the cue ball exactly where you want to hit. And then over the course of time, try to work the speed and the power back in. You're eventually gonna find, no pun intended, your breaking point to where you can only break so hard and you lose complete control of the cue ball. But dial it back a bit, slow down your stroke, hit the brake good and clean. You'll actually be surprised what kind of spread you'll actually get when you actually get a good clean hit on the cue ball. And then over the course of time, start to increase the power and increase the speed, but try not to lose control as you're doing it. I can guarantee you not only will that help your break, but it'll also help you with your regular shots, just like how that stroke, that bad stroke that you had over in rack one when you missed the one ball. So this is all that I really have for you, Roberto. I thought you played fantastic. Still, though, all things considered, finished everything off in 14 innings. Unfortunately, that last rack there when you actually tried to kick the eight ball in and you just end up kicking it into the wrong pocket. These things happen. You have good, solid information that you try to use. I think the problem is, is that you try to use too much information all at once. And I would probably suggest that you only use bits and pieces of it at a time, learn them, master them, or at least get good at them, and then try to add in other things. So that would start with slowing down how you hit the cue ball making sure that you know where the cue ball is going to go after making contact with the object ball. And then of course, when you make the object ball, so that way you can plan position for the next ball. Because we saw through the course of all three of these racks, every time that you hit the ball softly, roughly every time that you hit the ball softly, you made the ball and you had position for another ball. And then the majority of the times when you hit the ball hard, you missed the shot, but you got position on the next ball. So you have to wonder, had you made the shot with the same power, would you have gotten position? Maybe, maybe not. But if you're always having to play a shot, wait for the cue ball to stop, and then figure out what to do, you're not really playing good pool. You really need to be able to try to plan ahead and know before you take the current shot what the next ball is, possibly what the next two balls are going to be. And there's no better way to do that than to make sure that you understand where that cue ball is going to go after making contact with an object ball, which is easier to do when the cue ball is rolling slow, slower, therefore hit it a little bit softer. So that's all that I got for you. So viewers, what do you think of that assessment? Do you agree or disagree with any of my points? And just like how I mentioned over in rack one, when I said, leave a comment in the comment section to give some type of advice as to what kind of pattern you would have ran. 
Also, during any of these recs or any of my points or anything that I might have missed, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section below with the timestamp of the shot and whatever type of advice you'd like to give Roberto in order to help his game out. So if you like what you saw, then please give this video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and be sure to click the bell notification icon to be notified whenever I go live or publish a new video. Take care, everybody.